and they have weird things like, oh, I can speak my reality into existence and then I can work to achieve whatever my, so all of these things are very shirky. It's basically putting the human being in the place of God or saying that, oh, these are certain laws that if you do them, you're bound to have uh, success. And the reason it ropes people in is because they take certain elements of religion so that it can be palatable to those who believe in a religion. I say, oh yeah, my religion teaches something like this. But when you dig deeper into it, it's a very specific, unique way of thinking mm. of, of, that goes outside of what the deen tells you to do. And I'll say this, most women who say they're against polygyny would still marry the Prophet as a 10th wife, would still marry Abu Bakr as-Siddiq would still marry Umar, would still marry uh, Imam Ahmed, Abu Hanifa. Why? High value men, high value men melt away the resistance of women. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to another podcast of the T3M, the three Muslims, the realest podcast in the dunya. We are back again with the two brothers, brother Khalil and brother Ahmed. How are you brothers doing today? Alhamdulillah, man. Assalamu alaikum, wa barakatuh, everyone. Hey. Wa alaikum, wa I know, bro, this is part three of the Jin series. What are we talking about today? We are talking about genies. But specifically, psychedelics. Yes, the psychedelics. <laughs> there we go. Uh, All right, Bismillah, Brother Khalil. What are psychedelics for people that don't even know what the term means? It's a good question. Um, and I think to clarify, they're a type of drug, also known as hallucinogens. So when we look at them, or drugs, generally speaking, there are different classes. So there are some that are stimulants, there are some that are sedatives, there are some that are more dangerous than others. There are some that affect you mentally, psychologically, physically, all three. Uh, hallucinogens or psychedelics are things that, and it's kind of in the name, they make you see things, hear things, and they change your state of consciousness. And that's the thing that people in today's day and age are really trying to hone in on. So. People will speak about altered states of consciousness or psychedelics are almost the most altered states of consciousness you could probably get in in waking life, right? So they, and you would have definitely heard some of these. So LSD, shrooms, DMT, which is probably going to be the main focus of today's episode. There's also mescaline, which comes from cacti. Uh, there's other ones that I made in labs like 2CB, etc. So there's a whole range there. There are a whole range of different drugs. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll maybe ask Angel if you want to elaborate. And I probably missed a few things and you probably may know a bit more about this than me. I mean, after all, Angel is the king of psychedelics. So we got Rami as the king of intimacy. <laughs> and we got me as the, the king of psychedelics now. You already know, bro. What are you? What are you, the king of? I'm the king of podcasts, bro. I wanted to add something real quick, bro. When you you mentioned that people are taking this today, at a at a number astronomically higher than you know ever before, why would someone in their right mind today want to take anything like this? You went in a little bit on, they want to experience a higher level of consciousness, but what are they trying to do? To be honest with you, I think we have to look a bit more at history and how it's evolved. So many of these drugs have only been found fairly recently. Take DMT as a case study in terms of when it was discovered in the Western world. And we're speaking specifically about the Western world. There's a chemical that was first synthesized in the 1920s. It wasn't even known to be a hallucinogen or a psychedelic, so to speak, until the 1950s, I believe 1956. And then there was the 1960s, which was when psychedelics started popping. Right? And that's when everyone was starting to take it and everyone was taking LSD and wearing those 
uh, tie-dye clothes and everyone was being called hippies, etc. And then the war on drugs happened. So really, there's one, not been that much research on these drugs. So when people say they're completely safe, okay, well, for as far as we know, they're completely safe. To get back to your question now, we're living more and more in a godless world. So atheism is starting to creep up. But what we've seen as well, one thing is atheism isn't sustainable. So when people start living in a world without law, without God, this creates a void in the soul. And so we now see very prominent atheists like Sam Harris, for example, who has a meditation app. And there are many atheists who say they are spiritual. And there are many people who want to explore this. Psychedelics are seen as the almost pinnacle of spiritual states. Whether they are or not isn't what we're discussing at this specific moment. But people who take them think, I'll be able to explore. And because I don't have any laws to govern me. So in Christianity, it could be seen as pharmakiko, a form of witchcraft by taking these drugs. Um, other religions may say, no, don't take them, like Islam, for example. But other people who aren't religious, or they're agnostic, or they're atheists, they see this as, I can do, have my own experiences and come up with my own conclusions for myself. So there's that feeling of control now, there's that feeling of adventure, exploration. And they take it seriously as well. Most people don't take psychedelics consistently, unless they're serious about it, because it's not for fun. It's not like a joint, for example, someone who smokes a joint, they may just do it for, like, socially, same thing with alcohol, tobacco, etc. So it's very different, and people have to realize it's not the same as, for example, meth or cocaine or heroin, and it's not the same as alcohol or weed, though weed is similar to it in some ways, and they each have similarities to each other. It's, it's a very unique class of drugs, and that's why it has its own niche, but this niche isn't small, like you said, it's been growing and it's now reached a point where it's almost unprecedented and you have many states legalizing these things or actually looking into it so just down the road from me well, not down the road literally but down the road is imperial college london they've opened a psychedelic research center i remember a couple of years back literally two years ago from you know around this time last yeah around this time two years ago i remember being at school and some someone was sending me this link and he was like hey look at this king's college a very famous university is running psilocybin trials and we were too young to even like think about applying not that we wanted to but it was 18 or something and you have to have like mild depression but they were laughing and saying hey look you can now trip for free in in the uk in london and we were laughing but it's crazy when you think about it because not that long ago these things were heavily criminalized so we're seeing a transformation now more than ever before i have um and before i even speak how's my voice from here Sounds fun. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I have this uh bottle of soap. It's a uh, castor or castor soap. It's um very clean. Only has like a few ingredients, all natural. Um, I think it's called uh the company's Dr. Browners or something like that. Castillo and... soap, eh? Huh? Castillo soap. That's yeah, yeah, that's, that's it exactly. Clean, it's, it, it's legit. It's legit. Right? You don't even have to use that much because it's so strong, it's so potent. You just have to dilute it. So then, bro, on the bottle, it literally speaks about, like, a psychedelic treatment to be able to heal people who are, you know, going through these mental issues. And it's like, guys, like, if you break it down, it's very simple, all right? People take psychedelics for what reason? Experience more. Exactly. Everyone wants to experience more. So you're taking a psychedelic so that you experience more. Well, isn't that what religion is? Isn't that what God is? You're experiencing more? Yo, I have, constantly... a, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Why why did they put that on the soapbox? I don't understand. The program. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. If you actually look into it, it's um the guy, he's uh I think he's dead now. So, you know, may may Allah accept him if it's in his cards, but um I think he was Christian and he, he was real into like helping people out, healing the planet. And like his message and his mission was nice. But I think it's the people after him now that are trying to like add these little things onto it where um, the, yeah, the psychedelic treatment, I don't know, bro. If, actually, give me one second. I'm going to bring this bottle in here. Bro, listen, before you go, <laughs> all right, this man already took off. Guys, for anyone listening, I have a bottle of Dr. Bonner's too, which I use. It's very good. But he's not Christian, guys. He's Jewish. And every single bottle I got, there was some 
to a greater or lesser degree of religious propaganda. And I don't know why that is. Jewish propaganda or New Age propaganda? Jewish slash New Age. It started with Jewish and it was closer to when he was alive. It was more like Jewish. It was more like uh, religious and moral values of him. I'm sure Anhel can agree. That was superimposed in all of these packaging. Today, it's a little more New Age. But tell yeah, me what yeah, you got, bro. So, bro, look at this. First off, you're looking at this packaging and it's all it's already overloaded. There's like too much here. All right? And it, it's like all over, just all this writing everywhere. And um, right here, if I can actually get that in there, it starts saying the psychedelics. And I'll read it off because y'all y'all not going to be able to see it. But it says a uh, psychedelic assisted therapy was recently granted breakthrough designation by the FDA for use in treating PTSD and major depressive disorder epidemics for which pharmaceutical drugs have fallen short. And then it just goes on to kind of like hype it up. For lack of better words, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. You see that? You see that every day taking a shower, bro. Before you know it, you want to trip on some shrooms. You don't already done it, so I mean, exactly. No, I'm saying like the average person, bro. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's subtle, bro. It works in very subtle ways. Yeah. This is a really interesting point because when people speak about these these things, these so-called tools or plant medicines, they actually get really obsessed with it and. Many people try and defend DMT, who are Muslims, and say, well, it's not a bad thing. Why is it a bad thing? If you actually look at people who don't even do ayahuasca, just do DMT, they actually, the things that they do resemble acts of worship in a sense, because one, they'll start researching it, and then they'll build up this library of knowledge, and they'll try and set a good intention before the trip and say, this is my intention. I want to do this and I want to have this and I want to gain this out of the experience Mm -hmm. and I want to get closer and become more spiritual, et cetera. They'll say a lot of things. After the experience, they'll feel so grateful for what they had. So they'll have this shukr, they'll have this gratefulness. They'll start praising the experience and having this gratitude that no human being or object or worldly thing should have they'll start praising the entities and feel connected to it. They'll start actually encouraging other people to do it. And some of them even actually make hijra. They'll make a literal migration to the Amazon, to South America. So if you look at, even if they say, oh, it's not not worship. Okay, fine, you may think that, but one of the acts you've been doing resemble, they mirror a type of worship. And then people who go go into ayahuasca, that's a whole ritual in and of itself and that it has thousands of years proving that uh, yeah it's just mad and so they'll do things like this so they'll start a brand they'll make herbal teas they'll do something and they'll place their messaging in there and then they'll immortalize their experience and pass on this message as if it's some prophetic message yeah that, that's how it works and uh when i've taken shrooms like if you take enough shrooms like listen you are submitting to the shrooms there's no if ands or buts like I remember doing uh, over an eighth, and guys, that's that's a lot. I'll just say right here, that's a lot. And I remember taking this stuff, and um, anytime that I would start to think about something, and I was, uh, I guess you could say, coming out of the present, like not being fully present, the shrooms would basically make me want to throw up. And it was almost like slapping me, like trying to pull me back into like only this specific mode of experience, only experiencing the present. Yeah, I get it. You know, the presence is nice, but like we also have intellect for a reason. We have logic for a reason. So it's like this one thing, this uh, plant, this fungus, I should say, this fungus is over here only trying to make me experience uh, the reality in this, this way but not in the other ways. Um, so in, in essence, it is forcing me to submit. It'll force anyone else to submit. Just a, a little, little throwaway here. That's every, every single one of these has that same characteristic, whether it be DMT mm-hmm. or psilocybin. They'll, they'll make you submit, and you have to submit. And if you go in thinking it's going to be a fun ride, you're going to see clowns. You're going to have a terrible time because that's the nature of it. So you have to submit, which it's not a submission. This is also submission, but what are you submitting to? Mm-hmm. And some say, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it all out. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you really knew what you were submitting to, I don't I don't think you'd take those steps. Uh, I want to introduce a character here now because I think 
is relevant to what you were saying. There's a guy called Terence McKenna, and I've read a lot of his works and I've listened to, I don't know how many hours of his lectures, you probably heard of him. Another guy also really big in this field is Adam Watts. Both of these guys are dead, by the way, but they get millions and millions and millions of views on YouTube every single day. And there's a reason why, because let's take Terence McKenna, for example, he in the 60s and onwards up until he died in the 90s was a huge proponent of psychedelics. He went to the, he was one of the first people to go to the Amazon rainforest and try ayahuasca with his brother, Dennis, who's still alive. And with some of his friends, they were already big on shrooms. They were very studied as well, well studied, well educated, very fluent. They had a unique way of speaking. Terence was very vivid with his language. He used to describe the DMT experiences, the entities he saw. He would encourage people to do things in a certain way, to take three talks. Now, when people talk about DMT, they'll speak about three talks. He coined that. When people talk about heroic do dose on shrooms, taking five grams in silent darkness as well, he would highly encourage that. That was him. And he said, when you take that much in those settings, then the, the shroom will speak to you. And, it'll, and, and when I first heard that, I thought that was weird, but it kind of makes sense now. Because when you take that much, you're forcing yourself into that position in that environment. Of course, you're going to hear something. You're going to be in contact with something. And he used to joke and say it's the aliens. It kind of makes sense now. So there are these individuals who spread the word of these things. They are like Darius. They, they were respected as almost the same way. And what do you have to I don't mean it in, in a bad way, but the same way some people respect scholars, it was the same thing. Uh, so that's the kind of world we live in. It's a religion in and of itself, if you think about it. I mean, it's crazy, too. And and I got a question that I want to ask Ahmed here because uh, I want to get into this. But it's crazy that you're saying this because when someone takes psychedelics, all it's doing is allowing them to experience more. All right. But they're experiencing more of something that is already there. Like, you know, like I'm not saying that they're going to experience the creator, but the creator is already there. I'm not saying they're going to experience jinns, but the jinns are already there. I'm not saying they're going to experience another dimension, but the other dimension is already there. You feel me? So I'm not claiming anything here, but what I am saying is that when someone does take psychedelics, they experience more. And it's crazy to think that everyone has this innate, this innate thing where they want to experience more. They want to know the truth. Everyone wants to know the creator. They want to know why they're here. What's the purpose here? And then they take these psychedelics and then you have these people who are so closed off, so dumb. And, and I say that I say it like that. I'm not saying it to uh, speak bad about them. I'm not saying it at all like that. But in the Quran, it says like, uh, are, are the um, the believers the same as a, a disbeliever? Like is someone who is deaf the same as someone who is not deaf? Is someone who is dumb the same as someone who is not dumb? Is someone who is blind the same as someone who is not blind? So I'm only saying it like this, where it's like you have these people who they finally see it. They have the experience, but they still close off. They still don't believe it at that point where it's like, ah, OK, yeah, maybe there is something else. They're like, ah, no, it was just a, a, a it was a hallucination. It wasn't real. You know what I mean? So it's crazy to think that there are people that are so atheist that even when they do something to experience more, they just write it off as a simple hallucination. You know, I got like evidence to suggest or not to back what you're saying. So there was a study, we spoke about it last time, the John Hopkins University study at the time. So there's a percentage. There was a study done with 2,500 people. So for people who aren't following, we we're talking about a study done with 2,500 people uh, reviewing their DMT experiences, the most profound one. One of the questions was, the experience was more real than everyday waking consciousness. And 81% said, Yes, at the time. So during the experience, 81% said it felt more real than real. After the experience, only 65 said that. So people then, like you say, they, they have an experience and then they'll say, they'll go back. They'll go back and say, no, no, I can't have been real. So they'll try and deny it. I'm not saying it's a good thing, people are acknowledging it, but it's a reality as well. So in normal, uh, yeah, basically, let, they, let me kind jump of, that on kind of study this. follows that. Yeah, and, yeah, go for and it, go add for it. that you have different psychologists. So you have Carl Jung, who is very, very well known, very famous. He even wrote letters to Sigmund Freud, and would say that you know, in his psycho in his psychological works, that if he uh, couldn't figure out a patient, he'd drop his astrological charts, 
right? So he was very much into magic. And the way he talked about these entities was, oh, this is split off parts of your psyche, or this is a psychological projection, or this is archetypes. So they, it would be explained in a certain way that someone that doesn't believe in religion could still make sense of these experiences and continue on in this in this dark path. You also have someone like Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell wrote, um, I forget the name of the book, The Many Masks of God or The Many Faces of God, but their idea, people like Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell, their idea of what God is, is that it's just a human collective conscious projection. So we as human beings, we have each of us have an individual consciousness. They believe that all human beings together had a collective conscious. Like we all formed like one great soul and everything in the world had a soul. Everything formed one gigantic soul and that that was God. And this philosophically was called pantheism. Pantheism is based on God is one and all with everything. So that's how they explained it. And that's how they saw it. And they said, oh, heaven isn't really heaven. It's just, you know, getting to a higher level. Hell is people that want to be away from this type of consciousness and so forth. So they had their own explanations for it, such that they replaced God with themselves. So someone who's atheist can still look into the works of Carl Jung or... Um, Joseph Campbell or these people and still hold on to their atheist belief, but continue in this path. And if we look at it from the point of view of the previous episode, which, which and, and the first episode talked about messengers of deception and aliens and so forth, to the shaitan, it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you're not worshiping Allah. So if they can get the Christian to come believe by saying that, oh, this is Christian type stuff, this is actually the Holy Spirit, this, they can get the atheists in by saying, oh, this is the collective unconscious, they can get Muslims in by saying, oh, no, this is I'll get into the Muslim stuff later, but, you know, so from, from shaitan's goal isn't necessarily that you worship shaitan, although people do that. Shaitan's goal is that you don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to misguide as many people as possible by any means necessary. So this is how the atheist people tend to interpret their experience and they have their own mashayikh that back up, uh, that, that have an alternative narrative for all of these things. I want to that sounds like the new age say. stuff. Very much so. Very much so. They look. They they worship. They worship Carl Jung. Like they, they really look up to him. They, he's he's like seen as an island. But yeah. Anyway, just to quickly like jump on that. Like there was this one part of a study where it says twenty eight percent before the experience, before they encounter with these entities, said that they identify as atheists. After only ten percent. So that's almost a third. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's almost two thirds. Sorry, right? So who have gone from atheism to. Um, theism so someone might say why why as muslims would you hate that but firstly what is atheism anyway like well, it's not just not believing in god because i idolatry in today's day and age isn't like idolatry and uh, the idolatry of the past so obviously there are people who still in this day and age worship idols but now people are worshiping money people are worshiping power so they'll spend all their time and energy and effort the uh um what's the word dedicated to, to increasing their power in this world, their money, their wealth, or they worship women, or they worship drugs, or they worship something. They're, so even if they are an atheist, so to speak, they have taken the desires as their gods, so although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have, they, have you not seen the one who has taken the desires as their god? That's exactly what they've done. So they're going from one state of disbelief to another. It's not really a, uh, an improvement, so to speak, because now they've gone from worshiping many gods in subtle ways to actually worshiping many many gods or venerating these entities pretty directly so it's not really i mean it, it's not gonna make any muslim happy mm. uh, so that's not really an argument but i've seen it used quite a few times against muslims who say hey oh, don't take the it's dangerous because people want to find a way out especially muslims and we'll speak about muslims later i think but muslims want to muslims are curious because every human is curious and if shaitan has planted a seed in your mind and you want to follow it, you're going to try and make a hundred different excuses so that you are able to follow that path. But if that's the case, then you're not submitting to Allah. You've already submitted to your desires as well. So you need to also reflect on your know, it's, it's like those. It's like those people that smoke weed and say, nah, man, weed helps me think about Allah. It helps me calm down and I can pray better when I'm on it. And... <laughs> but I'll get to that and I'll, we can get to that later, inshallah. Yeah, so it's crazy what Ahmed was saying because it's, it's basically this new age stuff and that's that's their shot at uh replicating the quran like if, if you think about it the quran says uh, or my bad uh, allah says like uh try just bring everyone together work together 
and just try to bring something remotely similar, at least just one verse remotely similar. And they're over here trying to like break down what heaven means, what hell means, what God actually is and all this stuff. It's like, all right, where are they getting this? You know, are they just, mm. are they pulling it out of their ass? Cause that's what it sounds like, man. I mean, I, bro, I could sit down and I could basically allow my mind to like work its magic and just all these gears turning and come up with this crazy idea of to like what God is and, and what the afterlife is and all that stuff. But it's like, I can't claim that I, that I know it, you know, I can't claim that like, Oh, this is the truth. Mm, yeah. 100% bro. I can't wait till we go into how it's related to gin. Cause a lot of people are like, bro, this is a gin series. Why are you guys talking about psychedelics or, you know so brother khalil do you do you want to share some studies today like do you want to screen share or do you want to just read them off i can screen share yeah, maybe more yeah. Hopefully, okay, i'll make you i'll make visual. you yeah i'll make you host if you uh as soon as he's back you can we can share some stuff but yeah, i was sure. gonna say have you all ever felt for some new age spirituality before at least into dean if y'all ever had a phase where you weren't on dean 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean that's how i uh to be honest with you, that's why I know like all the stuff I know. So, like that, is, I think you, you kind of have these paths before you start practicing. If assuming you weren't like from when you were a kid, so yeah. that specific path you learn from those mistakes, and then you do things like this where you can help other people learn from the same mistakes you made. But I think, yeah, I especially in our day and age, more and more people are going to fall into it, which is why more and more podcasts and things like this need to happen because um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt the flow but hey, you're there. good we are damn and pull that <laughs> mic up <laughs> Why are they I'm here, here, here. yeah so we are uh, we we continued a little bit bro we continued a little bit nothing crazy but um uh Hali, he's basically saying it right now as to um yeah actually i, I don't know but well, Hali, continue bro continue <laughs> i can't really remember but i just remember like so we're, we're gonna now link this back to what does this have to do with uh gym so before we share a study uh i just want to say for those who don't know too much when you take dmt the thing that most people report that almost everyone reports if you take enough is that you leave this world so you're traveling through a tunnel your body starts to become paralyzed almost so it has no use you have to actually fight the 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 experience to keep your eyes open and to move your body so the natural thing to do in that state is to just submit physically mm. let alone mentally if you don't mentally submit you're also screwed because then you're gonna literally feel like you're in hell so it's it's, it's rough but notice that you travel to another world whether you actually travel or not that's not what we're saying that we don't know <laughs> again it's kind of like what Angel said in a couple episodes ago it's knowledge of the unseen so maybe maybe not who knows it's speculation at this point but you travel somewhere you feel like you're in some other place and then you meet entities that's the key pinnacle of the experience what they look like who they are I'll, I'll share that now so when we look at this study the main thing that the study focuses on is the entities so most of the data that co they collected was about how did the entity communicate with you. Um, do I have sharing permissions? Yeah, I'm just going to make you host. Yeah. Sure. So before you continue, um, just reflect on that for a second. Like when you take these substances, if you do not submit, you go through hell. You experience like the worst experience ever. Mm. Just, just let that sink in. But if you submit, then you have a nice experience. It's a dudgeon, bro, deception. Not only that, usually the first few experiences are sweet. Mm. And that it draws you in. So you're being pulled in now. You're having these sweet experiences. You're like, okay, I'll let go. I'll let go. I won't fight. And then you have these awesome experiences. That's usually people around you encouraging you, right? This is the culture now, the psychonaut culture. Yeah, man. You, you got it you, you got the flow you got the message you go back etc whatever i don't know who's around you and what kind of people are around you but you'll go back and you'll have all these blissful experiences you'll now spread the word a couple of years down the line this happened with terence mckenna towards the end of his life he had a mad crazy experience in hawaii he didn't trip for like 10 years after so why he had a mushroom trip that was so scary to him 
that he didn't want to trip. He's still dedicating life, his life to these things, but he couldn't because he saw something that he didn't want to go and see it. Oh, no. yeah. So when they use you and they're done with you and you've done their dirty work for them, like they'll throw you. <laughs> like, oh, you, no. you have no, no, no <laughs> that's the, bro, so I'll, before, I'll share this study now. Yeah. Before you screen share, bro, we had a question from a patron who was wondering uh, for Ahmed, how did you come up with the name Mr. Middlepath? I have no idea. This was a long time ago and it just kind of rolled off the tongue. I just thought, you know what, Mr. Middlepath sounds like the best name and I feel like it fits with what Islam is, like what we're trying to be. We're all trying to be on the middle path, not too extreme this way, not too extreme that way. So, mm. subhanAllah, I just thought, well, what's the name? And at that time when I first started the channel, I was like, what's the name that is feel like it has some grounding in Islamic values, but it's not so in your face that non-Muslims won't want to watch the channel. So I was like, you know what, Mr. Middlepath seems like a very good name. It's uh, it's accessible to everybody, but at the same time, it's based on Islamic principle. Um, uh, no, 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 I'm thinking of a different ayah, but there's another ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, that therefore we have made made you an, a middle nation so that you can be bear witness over all of the people and that the prophets will bear witness uh, that the prophet will bear witness over you and uh, this goes to, in, in the day of judgment uh, one of the narrations is that on the day of judgment certain people will deny that they saw a prophet or will deny that they had prophets come to them and it'll be the Muslims on the Day of Judgment that will bear witness for these prophets and say, no, we know that these prophets came to these people because our, our messenger told us that you had a, you had your prophets. So even though we didn't see those prophets, Allah has given us that honor that we will bear witness over the people as well. And um, it also ties in with Kuntum Khaira Ummatan Ukhrijat Nas Tu'miruna Bil Ma'rufi Tanahun Al Munkar that you are the best of people that ever came out. Why, though? Because you enjoin good and you forbid evil. So there's that thing that we have to do. We enjoin good and forbid evil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he's talking about uh, the Jewish people that were, that were cursed, that they never, you, they were cursed by their own prophets because they never used to see an evil except that they didn't, most of the time, didn't do anything about it. They just let it go. So even the good ones or even the ones who were better wouldn't stop the ones who were evil from doing what they were doing. It was, it, was, it was very rare, only small groups of them that would that would do that. But the majority of them, whenever an evil was done, they would just kind of let it slide, be like, oh, why bother? Why try and change it? Why talk to them about it? But I was trying to say about the Muslim people that you're the best nation because you enjoin good and forbid evil. So that ties in with Mr. the whole Mr. Middle Path thing. Mm. And also the channels that we have, like all of us, is to basically enjoin good and forbid evil in a way. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Well, let me lift up the mic so the static doesn't. <laughs> All right, I'll share this study now. So, uh, just just let me know when you can see see the screen. Yeah, is there? Shall... Yeah, cool. So it's a little blurry, no? Is it blurry? I'll zoom in, maybe. Is that alright? Yeah, it's definitely blurry. that's better. Can you zoom in a little more? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I don't know why it looks like super blurry. Like I can't even read anything. Um, it's it's not it's too blurry. It's, it's actually blurry, but it's legendary. There it is. Yep, it got it better. Is. Nice. Okay, okay. Cool. Maybe it's just for my my computer, but yeah, I'm sure when it renders, oh, no it'll come in clean. If you guys, yeah, can see it's it. clean. It's clean, bro. All right, perfect then. Okay, inshallah. So, uh, in the green, just is like I talked about the methods of the study. So, 2,561 people. By the way, this is the biggest study I've ever done. This was done 2020, so last year. It was an online survey about the most memorable entity experience after taking an N-dimethyltryptamine, which is DMT. So if you see that, just know that means DMT in blue. This is the result in brief, and we'll just cover this off because we're not going to read the whole study. But respondents report the primary senses involved in the encounter were visual and extrasensory or telepathic. And the most common descriptive labels for the entity were being, guide, spirit, alien and help it. so that links to our last our last session although 41 percent of respondents report fear during the encounter the most prominent emotions both in the respondent and the attributed to the entity were love kindness and joy 
then most people are endorsed that the entity had the attributes of being conscious, intelligent, and benevolent, i.e. they existed, they were real, they weren't just figured, like uh, figures of someone's imagination. They exist in some real but different dimension of reality. Again, I mean, look at these descriptions and tell me what you have in mind as an audience in the, in the mm. chat, but you know, they continue to exist after the encounter. So, so yeah, respondents endorse receiving a message, 69%, a prediction about the future, 19%, and more than half who identified as atheists before the experience no longer identified as atheists after. The experiences were rated as among the most meaningful, spiritual, and psychologically insightful lifetime experiences with persisting positive changes in life satisfaction, purpose, and meaning attributed to the experiences. So that's, a, that's a crazy paragraph, uh, and a lot could be spoken about just from that. And the conclusion of the study in pink was that DMT occasion entity encounter experiences have many similarities to non-drug entity encounter experiences, such as those, those described in religious, alien abduction, and near-death contexts. And these experiences and its interpretations produce profound and enduring ontological changes in worldview. So people who looked at reality in one way, all of a sudden have completely done a 180 and flipped the way they think about the world and and the way it works and the meaning of life, etc. So yeah, just just thought of the, off the off the bat of that. What are you guys uh, thinking? Well, it, it goes exactly with what I was stating prior. And again, it's crazy that some people will even get to this point and still write it off as just a hallucination. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Is there any way I can see you guys' videos? Um, I also yeah. want people to pay attention to where it says that it's very similar to alien abduction and near-death context. So mm -hmm. that was something we talked about in the last video. Of that, and Inshallah, when Brother Khalil goes forward, you'll see just the similarities between the alien abduction experience and the DMT uh, experience. Right. We're going to look here now. So this is the descriptive labels for entities. And I've... As you can see, I've like highlighted it in different colors. So blue being kind of nice. So being guide, spirit, alien, helper, angel. These kind of come off as friendly. And these are the most common. And it says could, could select all that apply. So the percentages won't add up to 100. But yeah, that's just. Then there's the pink elf, religious personage, plant spirit, fairy, chemical spirit, animal spirit. These Look at the red. Mysterious. Yeah. yeah, the red is where it's... Uh, Kind of worrying and it's also interesting that it's the least seen so clown demon no monster dead family member devil unknown dead person dead friend this a lot could be taken from this and you can kind of maybe you can read in some wisdoms and speculation but you know how i said in the beginning it'll rope you in and they'll seem friendly mm. that might be why all of this is mm. and then as you get deeper and deeper, it gets more mysterious until it just straight up messes with you and you start entering into like some circus with clowns and demons, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Pause, pause for a second. So it's basically like that abusive relationship where like people who are abusive, they'll come off as uh, very friendly, very loving at first. And then like the more you interact with them, the more closer you get to them, the real colors start coming out and then you start to see how abusive they are but by the time you see this it's almost always too late and like you're kind of just stuck in this abusive relationship with them and oh man it's subhanallah it's almost the same with uh these entities with these jinns these genies they are they can literally present themselves as like these uh blessed beings taking care of you helping you guiding you and then once you trust them Alas, that's it. Yeah, I couldn't have put it better myself, to be honest. They really do show you their true colors once the time comes. And they'll, then they'll just mess with you. And you're stuck not knowing what to believe anymore because you spent so long and invested so much time and energy into them, into the experience. Um, yeah, what's... That, that what was else? something that uh, John Keel mentions in one of the books, uh, Operation Trojan Horse, which we talked about in the last episode, where he said that it's categorically when you look at these mediums and spirit entities or whatever whatever it is that they present themselves to the people what they care about mainly is their message that you do the message that they want you to do or deliver the message that they want you to deliver so he says even the most kindest ones if you can call it kindness but even the ones that seem to be good 
care more about the message and the act, the action that you're going to do for them than they care about you yourself. So, and he gives examples of that. Uh, people that were mediums, people that were, um, he gives this funny story of a, did I tell you guys the story already? The story of the medium where he, uh, he, he's channeling this entity and he's, the entity's always talking through him and he's giving messages to his congregants. He was a Christian pastor and in the book, <laughs> he got sick. So he tells his friend, look, I want you to talk to the medium and ask a question for me. So he's channeling the spirit into him so that the spirit or the, uh, not the spirit, the jinn can answer the question that his friend will give him. His friend is asking about the pastor himself. So the pastor is sick and he's like, okay, ask the, ask the spirit about like my sickness and what I should do. So he channels the spirit, he channels the jinn. And the person's like, okay, you know, your, your, your host is sick. You know, what should he do? And the jinn snaps like, well, he better do something because I can't work through him much longer if he doesn't. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so it just, it just shows you like this guy gave his body for years and when he needed the entity, when he needed it, then she was like, F you, man, you know, do your mission and shut up. <laughs> it's man, man. Funny. But that just shows it's you what it is. It's true, man. I mean, some of these were, were what we looked at before. So was it real? Was it not? And how that changed during the experience versus after? Uh, where did it exist? Most said in some real but different dimension of reality. Some say in normal everyday physical reality. It kind of people are kind of confused about that one, so you can see it was a bit a bit mixed. Most people said it continued to exist after the encounter, and it changed the way they saw reality. So yeah, and these are the kind of attributes or characteristics of the entity. Only a few said it was malicious, 11%, so really not that much, but that's still a significant amount. And it goes back to our previous point, eternal. So a lot of people attribute to them divine characteristics of them being eternal, so them being man. sacred, benevolent, intelligent. Uh, so you can see how people put them, regardless of whether they say they worship them. That's, that's not even what we're getting at now. But they're saying they're secret, so they think they're holy, even if they're not religious. That's weird, right? That's weird. Uh, again, this is the atheist part, agnostic part. So most people started to believe in a higher power. So we have, you know, a belief in the ultimate reality, higher power, God, universal divinity. We've already spoken about why that's not necessarily a, a thing that Muslims will celebrate. And it's not a reason at all for people to take this as a Muslim. And you know, well, maybe that'll be the last thing we speak about Muslims and DMT. But what we need to realize is DMT has a deep history so its history is in ayahuasca, and we'll speak about that after we look at this study, just to understand how that links back to magic and why this is so dangerous. Uh, these are open-ended responses, so people wrote a message. Uh, so, for example, love. Love is the answer to everything, verbatim. So we've said that a few times, maybe, in this podcast, or, you know, love is the answer to everything. No, that's literally what they say. So this is one of the highest-ranking messages that were received. Um, our purpose is to love each other. This one's crazy, right? So the task or command given was worship me. Damn. <laughs> what? That, it says that. And this is John Hopkins University. This is a very reputable, in fact, one of the most reputable studies on DMT that I've come across. And this is what is said to people, worship me. <laughs> like what? <sighs> oh, no, oh, no, look, shook right now. Oh, I didn't know y'all could see me, bro. I, I can't see you. I'm, I'm trying to like look. I'm trying to like you know go closer to see it. Can you not to interrupt? But can you remind us of the study they were looking at the most positive experience or the most memorable DMT experience? Yes, yeah, so the idea was the most uh, most memorable. Yeah, the so, most memorable. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily yeah, a memorable entity encounter. It doesn't necessarily mean it was the most positive. Uh, and that's one of the limitations of the study in the sense that it's memorable, but there may be some less memorable ones that were far more traumatic. And the idea of these studies, by the way, when we look, take a step back and look at it from a bigger picture perspective, kind of similar to what Fayyad was saying in the beginning, they want to start using these things to treat depression. They want to start using these things to treat these illnesses. And the only way they're going to do that is through research, because you can't just start administering drugs. You need 
facts behind you. So you need surveys like this. And so they're going to want to try and capitalize on the positive experiences people have. And so that's a limitation for the study, but it's also a bad, it's bad news because they want the results to be good. So they don't want to have many percentages of the entities being malicious because they want to make use of these things and eventually make money out of it as well. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot there's a lot to it. It's not just more than, oh, we want to help people. People you know, aren't that good. My bad for interrupting you, but no. I'm looking at this now and I'm looking at the percentages and it's saying that 11% got to the point where it was basically, it was basically saying worship me. Like that was a task. And then uh, I guess below it says, um, do not tell anyone about this. And then the safety and assurance, it told me that everything was okay. I was being reassured that I was safe. Bro, bro, the whole worship me, like think about it, 11%, but that would actually be higher if the people kept going with these uh, psychedelics. Because a lot of times when people do have these experiences um, they may have like several more after and then just they're pretty much done. You know what I mean? Like they're not uh, they're not doing it anymore. Just trying to check something here. But dude, with that, like I think the people who kept going, who kept taking the psychedelics, they're the ones that experienced the point where uh, the entity finally shows its true colors and it twists and now it's saying worship me. So that's mm. kind of a lot of us. That's scary. You. You made a good point that I forgot to mention. Some people think that if someone was to only have two DMT experiences, then that's rookie numbers. You know, that's nothing. I know someone who smokes like two joints a day and does this and that and drinks every night. No, no, no. You can't compare them because one DMT by nature and most psychedelics, if not all anti-addictives, you take it and you don't want to take it again for a while because it's so intense. So if someone's done it more than 10, 20, 30, 40 times, you know, they're serious about it. And that's when it gets dark. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like you said, if they carry on, it gets crazy. Uh, but most people only do it a few times. And everyone I've met who's done it has, has said probably you know, one to five in terms of the number of times they've done DMT. I haven't met that many people. I actually haven't met anyone else who yeah, has yeah. said more than five. So, Bro, and on a side note, like, um, there's actually a very, there's a process that people can go through that allows them to... Um, basically decalcify their pineal gland, um, whether that decalcification or decalcification and calcification even occurs in the pineal gland. Well, that's up for debate. Some people believe it, some people don't. But there are things that you can do that will literally bring you, like your body, to produce more DMT. And I remember I started doing this with the sole intention of experiencing more. And look, bro, look how ignorant I was. All right, look how jahil i was bro I, I did it because i wanted to feel like i was on a shroom trip all the time <laughs> and uh yeah. i remember i experienced something that was so crazy that i was like yeah no nah, i don't want to do this anymore yeah yeah, yeah like I, I know you mean as well like when oh. you choose the right toothpaste and the right water and then yeah. you end up yeah. going through all of these processes all for what most people before they take these things especially ayahuasca they'll fast and you'll mm. you won't think much of that but if you add it all up like i was saying in the beginning you'll fast you'll travel you'll have an intention I, the word intention is hardly ever used it for anything else except for spiritual things and so now we yeah. have an intention before me although like there's a there's a reason why so you, you take and- a step back like even if you read through the study sorry i'll i'll, I'll just finish this point even if you read the study and you're not Muslim, it kind of you'll kind of be confused. You read it with Islam through the lens of Islam, and it completely cuts through it, and you're able to see it completely without any doubts, and you're able to pick like pick everything out and understand it and know what it's what it's all about because you have that perspective that Islam gives you. Yeah, hundred percent. Don't feel rushed either, bro. Don't feel rushed. I, I'm uh, I've been interrupting a lot lately, so please don't feel keep rushed. It, keep it going. Keep it going. Um, but I will say that uh, when you when you mixed in with this, when you're doing the whole pineal gland decalcification, when you're doing astral projection, when you're doing all this stuff, um, something that's very heavily linked with it is uh, this whole idea of the third eye, and that the pineal gland is the third eye, and that um, you need to open your third eye and uh, 
when I was doing this, I'm not going to lie to you guys, I was doing the natural stuff, which if you think about it, the natural stuff, the natural stuff seems fine. Like doing more natural toothpaste, drinking less fluoride, eating more organic whole foods. This is fine. But then when it's linked with, oh, we need to decalcify the pineal gland so we can activate it, so we can open the third eye. Well, that's when it becomes a problem because then now you're doing something with a different intention. Like you said, the intention matters the most here. So yeah, bro, I'm not gonna interrupt you anymore. I'll let you, I'll let you go in. And that was a good no, point. I wanna yeah. interrupt one more time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, please, after Brother Khalil shares this page, uh, just like how you shared your thoughts about, you know, the person, the being saying, uh, worship me, look at these red highlights here and tell us your thoughts on that, inshallah. One's yeah, on the page just, right now? Yeah, yeah, so the, there's the two main ones, the prediction about the future. So mm-hmm. someone thought about a missing Zippo lighter for some reason, and the entity flashed it to them where it was. And then after he came back to, came back, when he says come back, he means uh, he came back to this world, this dunya. He went to that spot deep inside a couch and grabbed it perfectly. It was unreal. Um, and then another one, the second one is, I was essentially told that I was God, or it gave me some information that said that this being, i.e. the entity, was in service of God. So, yeah, what are your thoughts? Damn, that's a lie. <laughs> I, listen, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this right now, okay? So... I've been wanting to say this the entire podcast. So I actually, hey, bro. You know, I'm, I'm hyped. I'm hyped to say this right now. Mm-hmm. So first off, before I say this, let me, let me preface this and have Ahmed jump in here. So Ahmed, you had spoken about the barriers. All right. Why don't you kind of touch basis on that in terms yeah. of like what the barriers are and um, what we do that can uh, basically reduce these barriers and what happens when these barriers are reduced. So ultimately what, and again, this. Here we go, bro. These, these (laughs) gyms are working hard, bro. Yeah. Everything, everything he does mention though, will be from, I think it was from a call we had with him right now about just yeah. the barriers between us Prophet and says, there we go there we go, go. go. There we go. Yeah, start there. over bro yeah, start over like you I'm froze like I'm all right i'm sorry guys but in, in islam we say uh, well, I would, uh, I would be, uh, before we eat uh, we say uh, before we go into the bathroom uh, we say certain adhkar even before intercourse with our spouse so adhkar for everything literally everything to uh protect us from the shayateen being present or for or even joining us in anything so magic very much in any of its forms is the opposite of that you're basically inviting them in whether you know you're doing it or not but you're inviting them in so that's that's what we mean when we say barriers it's any activity that you're doing and you're invi- that invites jinn into your life instead of the opposite which is what islam teaches is you're blocking them from 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 affecting you or from doing any harm to you subhanallah so okay. Yeah. So yes. psychedelic drugs or whatever that whatever that branch is, right? Whether it's a yoga and I'll, we'll get into yoga in, a, in, in another episode, inshallah, because uh, it's very similar to what we're reading here. Whatever that branch of magic is, basically, you're you're what you're doing is you're inviting them into your life. You're willingly saying, come, you know, so that, let, me that know if, let me know if uh, let me know if any of y'all can relate to this this whole barrier that you're saying goes down when we do drugs or psychedelics i feel like me personally when i sleep it really lowers that barrier at times you guys know so what i mean there before we sleep there's a lot of athkar that we say before we go to bed mm-hmm. so many you know Ayat of Kursi, you can say your, your three quls, qulhu Allah, qulhu adhru abin fala, qulhu adhru abin nas, three times. Then you have the dot before you go to bed too. Bismika rabbi wa datu jambi, that whole dua. So there's so many adhkar that you say. And there's even a book, it's called Fortress of the Muslim. Like literally, Fortress yep. of the Muslim. It's yep. full of adhkar in the, in, the, in the morning till the night. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu tells us, if you say this dhikr from in the morning, uh, that that the, the like jinn or like so the shayateen can't affect you until the evening. So what happens in the evening? You say the dhikr again. So you're consistently remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting you from all of this evil. 
whereas you know obviously with the magician he's doing the opposite he's saying please you know come more of you i'll i'll i'll, I'll accept i'll talk to you whatever he's whatever the, that person is intending whether they realize it or not simply by not doing the afkar we're weakening ourselves to this mm. type of influence uh not just uh jinn but also hasad right uh someone can give you evil eye right someone can have envy for you so uh, what is what is what is the one of the shortest surahs easiest surahs to remember <laughs> from the evil of the whispers of uh shaitan <laughs> you know so uh you're asking for protection from the shaitan of humans and of jinn right <laughs> so these are all ma'awudat all all, all of these are seeking refuge. I seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. I seek refuge in Allah from the whispers of shaitan. I seek refuge in Allah from evil people. So someone who's constantly doing this is going to be protected. And Prophet Muhammad says that you're going to be protected. You know? One and reflection I have on the... Oh, oh sorry. I thought you were... Ahead, no, 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 go ahead. Uh, okay, I was just going to say, it kind of reminds me of how we have... So Ibn Abbas, when speaking about certain ayat in the Quran, spoke about how uh, we have different seen angels assigned to us. So some that are there to write our deeds, some that are there to whisper good, some that are there to protect us from the front and the back, for example. Um, there's, like like um, Ahmed was saying, a certain afkar you can read or recite before going to sleep, and Allah will send an angel to protect you that night. There's a reason why, because I have experienced that when I haven't um, done any afkar, I've mm. forgotten or something, and I'm slipping into sleep, I have like, it gets, it gets weird, like it gets really weird, and you have like yeah. experiences that are trippy, and that you may see entities, and you may see these shadows, or if you have sleep paralysis, then that's a whole nother layer, and this will probably like tease the next episode, because it's I, similar I, to... I had, a, I had a very good friend of mine who used to be involved in, in, in Sufism before he got out, and uh, I want to talk about Sufism in another episode, inshallah. I'm not knocking on my Sufi brothers and sisters in Islam. You know, you, I love you all for the sake of Allah. I'm talking about certain tariqas and certain activities that some Sufis do. You know? But he was involved in that. And when he got out, he would experience. And even before he got out, he would experience like jinn dreams and weird things like that. And he would not, notice that when he did not say his afkar and when he did not, uh, or when he forgot to say his ma'awadat, that he would experience weird dreams or, or certain types of, the jinn will, and I've had m multiple friends who have had jinn try to attack them in their dreams, but alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. So the jinn was unable to attack them in the dream, and they woke up and they're like, yo, man, this was, this was actually a big one. I've had um, someone I know that was, uh, and I don't want to say this, actually, I don't want to say what the dreams were, but ultimately, we say our adhkar to protect us from those things, and then they cannot harm you. So, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that they can't do any, the magician can't do anything without uh, the permission of Allah. And in the case the shaitani kind of that the plotting of shaitan is actually quite weak. You know, it's we that accept. If you think about magic, what is it? It's you accepted the invitation. That's what it is. It's not that the jinn just came and forced himself on you. No, you accepted that he can come. You signed the agreement. You by by you gave your consent ultimately by taking the drug you gave your consent so they came if you didn't give your consent they can't come and what magic is the reason that magic is able to circumvent that you're able to hurt somebody else the jinn couldn't do it on his own he needed a human being to consent in order for that jinn to attack another human that's why the penalty for them for people doing magic is death in islam uh, and there was actually one story of, um, I forget, this was during the Umayyad dynasty. One of the kings was listening to an astrologer. So one of the Sahabas was still alive in that time. He brought his sword with him. The astrologer was giving his predic predictions and he cuts off his head in front of the, the king. And the king said, why'd you do that? You know, I didn't, I didn't tell you to do that. He's like, look, man, he said he's a magician. And he, can has, he has all these powers. Well, let him put his head back on. If he can't do that, then he's not a magician. So the king got angry and threw him in prison. But... But with that sword strike, he basically showed everyone that this man is a liar. And I, I, I think I, I want to talk about that in the yoga episode because some of the powers that yoga yogis say that they have is that they can be revived after death. They can live after death. They're, they, have, they have the power of immortality and so forth. And when you look at some of the stories that they have, actually, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let's save that for the, for the yoga episode, mm -hmm. inshallah. But uh, ultimately... Um, 
magic is not as strong as people uh, think it is. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the weakest of the of the houses is the spider's house, right? And if we look at what's what's a powerful magic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاءُ بِسِحْرٍ I forget the exact ayah, but they basically came with great magic. The, the, the pharaoh, the, the pharaoh's magicians, they the threw their, spring. yeah, they threw their sticks and they threw their ropes and they placed, cast magic on the eyes of the people and the people believed that they saw snakes wriggling. And it says in the Quran, وَجَاءُ بِسِحْرٍ عَظِيمٍ That this was actually great magic. So what was the great magic? Hallucinating, giving people the illusion that they saw snakes. Comparing that to an actual miracle, where Musa Islam threw his stick and it became a real snake, like an actual real snake. So we see that magic is a very cheap imitation of what the prophets can do, right? And what miracles are. That magic is just a cheap imitation of that. And who were the first people to believe in Musa Islam? It was the magicians. They saw them like, yo, this is not magic. This is a real miracle. We believe in Musa Islam and we believe in the God of Moses. And Pharaoh killed them. Because he, he was, he got, he got very angry about that. But they saw that reality. They realized that they were like, "There's no way." And they also said that we, we repent and we turn back from this magic that you forced us to do. So even, even the magicians didn't like being magicians. They, they blamed Pharaoh and said, "You forced us to do this magic. You, you made us get involved in this lifestyle. We didn't like it. We, we hate it." So that says a lot. That, that story is a very powerful story in the Quran. I mean, one of the benefits that people take from this story is that they were supposed to be the best magicians at the time. And yet when they came face to face with a, a true prophet who wasn't using magic, but they claimed it was magic, right? Fir'aun claimed that he was doing magic. He beat them at their own game. And so that's why they all accepted Islam. So when we're talking about all these things, we realize that Islam will not any explanation of these entities out of the water. And so when people usually hear about it and people who Muslims who have or people who aren't Muslim take DMT and then they hear the Islamic position oftentimes they do come to Islam I'm not saying DMT is a good thing and actually I'm just going to share screen one more time just to show why it's so bad just to wrap this kind of like part up about why it's so evil so let me know if you can see this clearly inshallah I'm going to take a second zoom to in. render yeah zoom in oh. yeah zoom in how's that yeah, that's much better. But it, yeah. it'll render in a second. It takes a little bit to render. No worries. But the, the kind of point of just sharing this is, let me speak about ayahuasca now. Ayahuasca is an ancient brew that has been used for thousands of years, and the main active ingredient is DMT, right? And there are actually two ingredients, one, which is the DMT, and the other, which is an MAOI inhibitor. MAOI, or it's an MAOI, sorry, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Now, when you normally have, DMT is found in plants, by the way, it's found in human beings, it's found in plants, it's found in animals, it's found throughout nature. But normally when you eat a salad, for example, you're not gonna trip on DMT because your stomach has natural enzymes to break it down. So it will never enter your bloodstream. However, somehow these shamans from thousands of years ago knew to combine the these two. Can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah, they knew, to, they knew to combine these two plants, one which was rich in MAOIs and one was which was rich in DMT. How they knew? Well, their explanation was the plants told us, or the plant spirits told us, which doesn't make any sense if you don't believe in spirits. But it makes sense if they already had some sort of connection with these gem. And what they wanted to do was then progress that connection to now see them and interact with them more and get to know them. So this is a type of magic which is why doing DMT is extremely dangerous. And here it talks about how magic has been defined by many ways. So there's some which is ruqa, which is words said by magicians, and knots, which affect the heart and body, leading to sickness and or death or separating the husband and wife. These are some symptoms or some use cases, negative use cases. And then there's two main types. There's the magic, which is ruqa, knots, this type, is, this type is done with the help of shayateen by worshipping them so that they can provide the services to the magician. This type is shirk. So it's the, one of the, the worst crime you can commit. And whoever practices it is no longer Muslim. So if you're a Muslim beforehand, that's it. You've nullified your sin. Dangerous, dangerous stuff, which is why no Muslim should ever approach these things, not even as a joke. And the second type is 
like look look at this magic used by herbs and, and medicine plant medicine right that's literally what it is herbs and medicine plant medicine and this may have some effect on people's vision there is dispute amongst the scholars whether this type of magic um is shark or not so whether it's major kufr or not um and there's and the rest of this goes into the difference of opinion but i just want to share that to show look this this isn't a joke and dmt isn't just this fun thing i want to try it and then see what i see and see what i experience as a muslim and see if it increases my iman you're not going to get a piece of paper say i'm going to laminate this piece of paper and then put that piece of paper in a shredder because that wouldn't make any sense and there is a strong punishment against the magician, like I said, because it's so dangerous. One of the use cases, like we just read, was breaking, and this is the use case in the Quran, is breaking a husband from his wife. So what is a magician doing except breaking society apart? What's so beautiful about Islam is on an individual level, it purifies. On a family level, um, it, on a family level it, it unifies. And on a societal level, it helps them, it guides them all to the divine. So it creates this beautiful system where the whole nation is in servitude to Allah. The magician breaks up the family. It poisons the hearts of the individuals and society is now in disarray. Once you break the family, and you guys will know this, once you break the family and you add all these ideologies which try and remove the family and remove the father figure and the, the wife, etc., the mother, that's it, it's over, right? Because now society is crumbling and we're seeing that now with our own eyes. So the magician isn't to be taken lightly. And so such a crime, even though DMT may seem harmless, what does it lead to? People start doing more practices. It's only a stepping stone to something even worse. It's worse in and of itself, but you can see why it's so dangerous. So the main message is don't do it. And don't even think about doing it because that's a seed planted by shaitan. Protect yourself with the girl and protect yourself mentally. And Islam is way better. What you sell a bit of pleasure in this dunya, which is, it may feel infinite, but it, it isn't. It's a few minutes. DMT is five minutes. Ayahuasca is a couple hours, a few hours. Would you sell that for infinite pleasure, for infinite time in Jannah? Who would, who, who sane would do that? So, yeah, that's that's my random. I think I want to I wanna throw in a question. Unless, Angel, you have a question you want to throw in first. I spoke a lot, so I'm going to let you go in. All right, so the question is, and remember one of the subscribers to your uh, channel, the Three Muslims podcast, they were asking, okay, well, what about um, law of attraction and what about the secret and all of this? So those people say, oh, but that's black magic. This is, this is white magic. <laughs> so what would be the response then for those who genuinely believe? I'm not mocking anyone. I just, I just think it's funny because of, you know, when you see what you see, then you know how... how, how um, uh, how deceptive this this argument is and but i'm not making fun of anyone because you know everyone a lot of people have been there where they genuinely do get deceived and confused so what would you say then for, to those who say well yeah but that's black magic what about white magic what about law of attraction what about these things what you're what you're doing well regardless of the term you're going to use is the same thing there's no it's a nice way of trying to differentiate. Oh, this is bad and this is good. I can take, it's like having trying to take, have your slice and eat it. You know, you're trying to have your slice of the cake and eat it. You can't do the, like the, the same thing. Uh, the practice is evil by default. So there's no, there's no concession because if we start opening up the door to just this part, why? What's the, what's the real difference? So then you open the door to X, but not why? Well, that's that's a that's hip hypocrisy. So people are then going to pursue why because X is good and Y is for some reason black. But the more they learn about it, the more they realize it's one and the same thing. It has the same origins back in history. So uh, there's no such thing as white and black. It's all just magic. We don't say black magic and then white magic. That no one says that. Um, it's a crime. It's a crime. And the the idea of law law of attraction is is by default shirk and it's used by magicians. Um, it's used by magicians and it's a form of empowering the universe in a sense we make dua we trust Allah we we don't we don't put our wants and wills out into the universe and hope that it will manifest we put it into dua and we trust in Allah so it's I don't I don't really know too much about the law of attraction maybe it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like nature worship in a sense you're sending out your desires to the universe and then the universe fulfills your your desires and if you 
so there's a lot to it, but ultimately it's, so what they're asking you to do is shirk, right? When you send your desire out to the universe and they have weird things like, oh, I spoke, I can speak my reality into existence and then I can work to achieve whatever my, so all of these things are very shirky. It's basically putting the human being in the place of God or saying that, oh, these are certain laws that if you do them, you're bound to have uh, success. And this idea is also in that in the book by Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Very, uh, very popular book, especially entrepreneurs love to read. Oh, yeah, Think and Grow Rich has the best book ever. But it's the same thing as the theory of the law of attraction, right? You send your thoughts out to the universe or you will your own reality into existence. So it's basically replacing man with God. And it's very similar to, to, to these pagan ideologies, if you look, I remember when I was reading the Napoleon Hill book, there was one thing that really caught, that, that really went, whoa, and I don't have the book with me right now, but I do remember this very vividly when they were talking about people who are poor, it's their fault for being poor because they didn't try hard enough. The ones who are successful, they willed it. They believed in themselves. So it's your fault if you're poor. And this is just what the kuffar said in Mecca when Allah SWT tells them to donate money to the poor, they said, should we give money to those whom Allah could have given uh, risk to? Like, why should we give money? Why should we give charity to the poor? And it's a very arrogant way of thinking too, that, oh, I did this. Just like um, just like Qarun and, and, uh, and, and from Bani Israel, he had so much wealth that even people who were holding his keys had difficulty holding his keys. He needed an army of men to hold his keys to his wealth, not just the wealth itself. So that's how rich he was. And he said, I got this from my own cleverness. This is from me, right? And Allah caused the earth to swallow him up. So it's just a form of arrogance ultimately. And the reason it ropes people in is because they take certain elements of religion and put it into their books so that it can be palatable to those who believe in religion. I say, oh yeah, my religion teaches something like this. Oh, I can do this practice because it doesn't go against my faith. It's just, it's just a certain um, way of thinking. But when you dig deeper into it, it's not a certain way of thinking. It's, it's a very specific, unique way of thinking mm. of, of, that goes outside of what the dean tells you to do. My yeah. mic is, is actually working. Let me mute myself. Yeah. Bro, I can't be the only one that wants to ask you guys, you know, what does music have to do with this? Where does music chime into this? I, I can maybe even like share a couple of thoughts. So music is, you know, some, some people speak about music as being food for the soul. They're not, I, I wouldn't say they're too far from the truth, but I wouldn't call it food because food implies nourishment. It's more intoxication. So it reaches into the soul and it, and it makes it feel a certain way and it changes the way you think and it changes the way you feel. However, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, a scholar of Islam, um, he, he had this really cool analogy where he speaks about Actually, I won't even use that one. He had another one, which he said oh, very simply that the Quran and music cannot exist in the same heart. So they'll have to fight it out and one will win over the other. And it's almost a symbolism of, are you going to choose the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the path of shaitan? So though it may not seem bad, and most, the vast majority of scholars have, have forbidden music with musical instruments for a reason, um, based on uh, ayat in the Qur'an and sayings of the Sahaba, etc. There's a reason why, because it's a tool of shaitan. It's something that he uses to reach into your heart. So if your heart is not occupied with uh, the Qur'an, something else is going to take that place. There's a reason why people listen to music. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel a certain way. It puts them in a certain vibe. But the Qur'an, nothing can replace it. And that should be our goal. And so you can think of it as a symbolism for how you want to live your life. Uh, look at the end part, look at the goal, think of life as a, as a mountain. I'll get into this in the next episode, inshallah, how I try and live my life in this kind of picture and how I try and walk towards things to make sure that I stay Islamic in my decisions. But the point is, that's the kind of analogy that I've, I've liked the best. Mm. And in terms of how it leads to sin, that's quite clear. Look at lyrics in today's day and age. Look at lyrics... Uh, in any kind of song, whether it's a love song and someone's attributing their heart to someone else, like you, my heart belongs to you. What does that mean? Right? Or whether it's talking about more, you know, 
basic things like money and love and drugs, etc. So women, etc. So it's gonna lead to sin. Um, it's gonna lead. To, it's mm -hmm. not gonna lead to lead to good. Bro, I don't. I don't want to speak for the choir, but this is just for my life. My life didn't really get on Dean until I stopped music. You know what I mean? Like I thought I was on Dean. Mm -hmm. I was still you get that feeling that you get um, annoyed or like kind of like people that smoke cigarettes and quit quit after a while the smell of cigarettes is nasty you get that mm. feeling when you hear music like it's kind of like annoying hundo, and, bro, hundo. Yeah. i couldn't even drive without music or uh -huh. you know now it's like it's been months man it's like i really feel on dean you know mm. Alhamdulillah. I, I do want to say something very important that even way before the time of the prophet Muhammad and amongst non-muslim societies it was well known that music even without lyrics changes your mental state so this was written in plato's republic socrates is talking about this in plato's republic um not socrates in plato's republic so plato is the one who's they're talking about what's the ideal republic do they uh do they ban music or do they let music be allowed and there's other books on different habits like archery versus music which is the best these are classical books right so they note that uh stringed instruments makes men soft and womanly and in, in, um, uh, allows one to have womanly qualities. That's stringed instruments specifically. Drums make someone more warlike. And I forgot what the flute and wind instruments do, but stringed instruments, they have the story of, for example, Plato, uh, Plato and Plato's Republic says, we're gonna ban stringed instruments, but we're gonna allow the drums. And in another story, you have the em uh, emperor of Persia, I forget which one, he wanted to conquer a certain people that were very warlike. So he said, okay, let's change their culture first before we conquer them. Let's introduce our musicians and our stringed instruments in and try to have them change their culture such that the men wear uh, longer skirts instead of pants, right? Once we get them to change their culture in that way, then we can conquer them, it'll be easy. And that's exactly what happened. The, the stringed instruments became the fashion uh, the fashion of clothing changed from skirts, from long pants to skirts. And then the emperor said, all right, now it's time. Let's get at it, right? Let's conquer these people. And you have this, you know, in the ancient books, like these are ancient works. And it's been said that if two civilizations that never contacted each other reach the same conclusion, it's, it, it would be wise to pay attention to, what's, to what they're saying. So stringed instruments were known to make men soft and they're prohibited. For that reason, for, for most warlike warlike countries didn't like, for the same reason they didn't like weed, because it turns men into, uh, for want of a better word, uh, soft pussycats, you know, they're not going to go to war, they're not going to take action, they're not going to get up, they're not going to do what they need to do, weed and stringed instruments. Um, is the piano is a stringed instrument? It is, isn't it? Yeah, it is, because it's, it's, yeah. it's like a mix yeah. of percussion yeah. and string, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to turn... Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from what we understand, the deaf was the only permissible one. And on certain occasions, uh, the deaf was a type of wide, uh, thin drum. And you couldn't really play the same rhythm on the deaf that you can with a regular drum. You know, the one that makes you get up and dance and so forth. Also to note, uh, Prophet Sheith Alayhi Salam was one of the sons of Adam. After Habib passed away, he had Prophet Sheith. And I recommend people to look into the lives of the Prophet stories. Uh, very important. Uh, Prophet Chith alayhi salam, uh, he was trying to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the people that had gone astray. At this time, human history was still very young. So shirk hadn't really happened yet. But shaitan came in the form of, uh, of a human being, right? So these were the descendants of Qabil that Sheikh was trying to um, talk to, to become Muslim. These were the ones who, who were with Qabil. And uh, shaitan came in the form of a human being and basically said, let me play music for you guys. This is to the people of, of Qabir. And what was the instrument that he played? He played a, a, a flute or a type of wind instrument, right? And that got the people dancing, that got the people partying, uh, that led to zina. And Prophet Sheet would prevent his people from going over there. And some people didn't want to listen to him and they would go over there to party with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, what's it called? With the, with the woman there, right? So the people from that were descended from Qabil had very ugly men, but beautiful women. Yeah. The people descended from the people descended from Habil had very handsome men, but the women were not as as beautiful as the people of Qabil. So what yeah. happened when they went over is the the crime of zina started happening again. The, the crime of shirk hadn't really started yet because it was still early in human history, 
Although mm. some people say that shaitan came in the form of a, of, of a human being and, and somehow got Qabil to start worshiping fire, right? This is, I've heard this from scholars before. But to note that the wind instrument was the one that was being uh, selected by shaitan. And you see this theme, right? Like in, in, in Europe, you have the Pied Piper uh, playing, the, playing that wind instrument to uh, lure the kids away from their parents or from their homes. So these musical instruments well understood that they had certain abilities to uh, seduce the senses, seduce the minds of men. It's used by cults and by yo uh, by certain uh, tariqas and certain in worship, right? To get to a certain state, they'll use music to enhance that, uh, that, that ecstasy or that spiritual high that they want to achieve, you know? Um, as for whether musical instruments are halal or not, some scholars would say that, okay, it's okay as long as it's remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or as long as the lyrics are about remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as far as we know, the majority of the scholars were on the opinion that nasheeds, which is just vocals and poetry, as long as the lyrics are okay, that's what was considered to be acceptable. But the musical instrument itself, even if you take out the horrible lyrics, the musical instrument itself still has a massive effect on your psyche and your mm. state of mind, which is why it's mm. to be avoided. And this was understood by non-Muslim cultures throughout history as well, how powerful musical instruments could be. I wanted to touch on that, that story, bro. So there were like a group of, like the first one had like the attractive men and not attractive women. And the other mm -hmm. one had unattractive uh, men, but attractive women. And then after the music was introduced and they started, you know, free mixing and all that, I believe it was the attractive men started, you know, mating with the attractive women, right? And then vice versa. They like intermingled between the two groups. They were partying together they were from partying the music. Together, they yeah, came yeah. they came because of the music, you know. So mm. subhanAllah. And uh mm. Shaitan coming in human form is something that I want to talk about in, in the in, in the next episode. But to bring it back to the topic itself, Brother Khalid, if you could show the um the highlight, the red highlight again to the messages that the entities gave. But I think that's very important. That ties in. That's that ties in with the previous episode of aliens, and it's going to tie in with the next episode of, of of yoga and so forth. So yeah, I did have a question too. Um, in it terms in, of, huh? Throw it in. That's that's what I'm doing. Bismillah. <laughs> Bismillah. So you were saying the musical instruments. How there's um there's one. That of which is permissible, I think it's uh it's the Arabic drums, but what they're called the what? Deaf, deaf, and it's it's deaf. it's a very wide, thin drum. It's very difficult to do any type of like actual music on it. It's just a very simple dum 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 dum, and they play that in weddings or so forth. So okay, so what what would be the difference between that and um like have you ever heard like war drums? Where it's like there's really there's not rhythm like dancing. I will say but... I don't know honestly. Okay. I'm gonna say okay. I don't know. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've 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 heard like what you're speaking about war drums. Actually, mm -hmm. I can't remember when it was. It was ages ago. So no one called me on this and no one act on this. But I did read a fatwa, or well, I I read a fatwa which spoke about specifically at the time of battle, one poetry should be used to encourage the fighters to raise their spirits, and um, they cited some evidence and the same thing they said, if if an uh, instrument was to be used, then the only one that would be permissible would be the, the, the drums of war. I don't quote me on this and don't act on this. I mean, unless you're in war. And even then, don't. Just do your own research and ask a sheikh, basically. But those, those wide, thin drums, uh, yeah, let's not, let's not go into it if we, if we don't yeah. know. I, I do want to yeah. say that, that those little drums that they play in the parties, the Arab ones, they go, tick, 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 tick. like, those are really fat. You can't, you can't do that on a deaf. Like you can't mm -hmm. actually do that. It's very, very difficult. So it's not used for that. I got anyway, you. Yeah. I got you. Well, I mean, it, it's all kind of registering very clearly because if you think about it, like imagine you're going to war and then they're playing like piano music. Uh -huh. like, it just it. wouldn't work. It, you wouldn't be hyped up. Um, yeah. I had uh, when I was a personal trainer, I had a client and he told me that um, he used to play rugby. And when he would play rugby, his uh, coach would have this drum and then he would just start beating this drum and he would go around the players and he would actually change the rhythm whenever he would get to certain players just to see their reactions. And he said that 
whenever he would find a, a rhythm that would cause the the player to almost get irritated, like start getting angry, he would continue that rhythm just to like keep hyping them up even more. And it worked. Like it worked. He said that they would go into games and it's like they were out for blood and they would win every single game. So it, it's crazy that you guys said that the drums was basically like a war. It, it has the warlike characteristics. It increases that. And the uh, the string and the wind instruments, they increase the feminine qualities. Because, like, that's something that I knew is that the piano will lower testosterone. Mm. Mm. So it, it's I've just had, it's crazy, yeah. I've, I've heard some in the shade which have the drum in the background to, like, maximize lyrics. And I've heard it. You know, like, I remember one, one cousin was like, hey, listen to this. I was like, oh, this is good. And he's like, okay, this is the drum version. I was like, what? And then I listened to it. I was like, whoa, my, I could feel, like, my, you you feel like something. I don't know what it is. Yeah. You, get, you get that that drive. I wouldn't recommend yeah. it, uh, but yeah. that is what it is. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I don't want anyone to misunderstand what we're saying and say, "Oh, uh, they they said all we can listen to drums." It's not what we're saying. Consult yes. with your local imam and your scholar about what uh, to do because you know we're not scholars. You know, if you follow we're not, a particular we're not qualified. Method, yeah, if you follow a particular method, follow that, uh, and and ask your scholars about that. We are, we're talking about this from a historical point of view. That's just really what we're saying. And we're trying to give you the argument that music affects your psyche, which is ties in with the psychedelic and the new age culture because very much so they use music to enhance certain states of mind. That's what we're trying to say, people. So please don't misunderstand us. <clears throat> All right, brother Khalil, you can- Throw that disclaimer. Sure. Yeah, sure. Sorry, Ahmed, you wanted me to um, share this. Remember, remember the second, yeah, remember the second, uh, Bro, so we had the red that said worship me, but then when we go down a little bit, it's there's yeah. the other one that said oh, he is in the service of God or whatever, right? So we can go to yeah. that one. Before I do that, I just remembered in our video we didn't actually cover this, which is kind of funny because we were supposed to be comprehensive, but I missed it. Here, right underneath, it talks about the similarities of DMT entity encounter experiences to descriptions of non-drug entity encounter experiences. Mm -hmm. I won't read it, but. This, this is a huge part of the study. Like, it's yeah, going yeah. into a lot about this. So, this, we did this is cover just this. A, we just didn't, we did cover this because they um, they didn't go over as deeply as we wanted to go over. So, we had to look into other books and stuff. But and that's if, true. If you go up, if you go up um, yeah. a little bit, just to that red part. So, for example, stop right there. Um, they told me, um, hold on one second. Yeah, so this is going to be a clear, distinct divide and a restructuring of society with the well, come on, of come on a bit back. I think we got that static. Oh, okay. Here, my bad. My bad. Perfect. Can you can you zoom in a little bit? Because I have to lean in to, to actually. Oh yeah, no worries. Where was the thing about the lighter? That's up here. That's up here. Okay. So you see this here. There's going to be a clear, distinct divide between if you if you scroll back up, just a little bit. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to go to the lighter. Yeah, there's going to be a clear, distinct divide in the restructuring of society with the assistance of ET consciousness. So that one right there, um, the one that you're looking at right now, the top one, I mean, that's exactly what I talked about in the previous video with the aliens coming in and talking to people. So how on earth is someone taking DMT? Well, are they going to another planet? So this is, again, proving what those authors in the past book were talking about, that this is not something extraterrestrial. This is something here on earth because whether it's a spaceship coming from the sky or whether someone's taking a drug, you have an entity saying, saying the exact same thing. Uh, if we go up to the, to the lighter thing, right? Uh, this was also mentioned in the previous uh, video where they would give some information to prove that they were an authentic being that, and to try and wow you into following them. So the same thing, even with the alien contactee experiences, people would have something similar to this, right? It's very random. Why does an alien care about where your lighter is on the, on the couch if it was really extraterrestrial? So if we go down a little bit to where it says uh, they are God, um, or, or even here, I will die in my 60s from something I can prevent. I was told that the day I'm going to die is June 27, 2067. So remember what we talked about in the previous video about UFO cults, where they give these types of predictions to make people believe. Uh, so all of these messages from DMT entities are very similar to the messages that we talked about in the UFO entity encounter experiences, even though those people didn't take DMT, they never took DMT. This is them seeing the alien coming to them or uh, 
if, or it's an alien abductee or contactee experience, whatever it was that we talked about on the previous video, but this is very similar messages, right? And when we go into the next episode on yoga, it's also going to be very similar messages where yoga was some historians dispute whether it's 4,000 or 6,000 years ago that these type of practices started. But however, the case is you have this connection and the similar theme in these messages between people that go into yoga, people that do DMT, people that uh, think that they're talking to aliens. So again, this is proving that these <clears throat> phenomenon are all one and the same. And it's coming from the world of the jinn. This is what we're trying to say. And well, thanks for tying it together. Yeah, so the last thing, I think this will be a good close out here. Um, it's the thing I've been waiting to say the entire podcast. Yeah, so um, remember how I asked you to talk about the, uh, the barriers yeah. and all that? Yeah, so essentially before I even say that, I'm just speaking on this whole barrier thing, I forgot to say this, but Fire, when you said that you go to sleep and you feel like the barrier is lowered at that point, I feel like if you wake up from your sleep, like let's say you're about to go to the bathroom or something, your barrier is real low. Cause like, I don't know about you guys, but you know, sometimes, sometimes I've, I, I experience some things where I'm like, Ooh, like, I, I gotta start praying and everything in order to like, sleep. I guess you could say bring the barrier back up. No, no. When you wake up from your sleep, mm. like in the middle of the night or something like that, like yeah. that's a time when your barrier is real low, but that's not, that's not what I'm trying to say here. So, if we're talking about the barriers, all right, think about this. Okay, it could happen when you take a psychedelic. It could, it could happen doing anything else in your life. But primarily this happens when you take psychedelics because this, it makes you submit to the psychedelic. All right, now, when you submit to it and whatever this thing is, uh, the entities, you, know, you already know what they are, the genies. All right, we know, we know. This thing will basically present nothing but good, right? Very good characteristics. It'll say, ah, like I am a servant of God or I am a helper. I am all this stuff, okay? It starts like that and it gives you, like we were talking about, it gives you a good experience. It gives you something good where it's like you start to open up more and more. And once you're fully open to it, well, now I can give you 99 lies, and you're going to believe these 99 lies because it's already been telling you these things and uh, opening you up and you basically trusting it. You're basically submitting to it because you you're seeing it as like, oh, well, it's not doing anything wrong now. Now, when it gets to the point, oh, worship me, it's like something inside you is going to be like, whoa, like something's off here. But you're probably going to be so far gone that you're probably going to ignore that and you're going to start worshiping that. And it might be the most subtle thing. It really might be the most subtle thing, or it might not be the most subtle thing. You might have that internal resistance because something inside of you is really trying to like prevent you from doing this. You know, call it the fitra if you guys want to. But something is definitely telling you not to do this. Uh, so again, it, it all comes back to uh, they they feed you one truth with ninety nine lies, and once once they've reeled you in that's when they start feeding you the lies. And someone might be like, oh, well, why why the psychedelics? Like, psychedelics is a natural thing. Like, you got weed, it grows, you know, naturally. You got the plants here for the ayahuasca, that grows naturally. But again, like, if you, if you collect everything that we've spoken about in this podcast, and you, you've read the Quran, like, you understand, like, when Adam and Eve were, I, I believe it's the garden, correct me if I'm wrong, they were told not to eat from a specific tree, not to eat a specific fruit. And what did Shaitan do? He, he convinced them to eat this fruit. And for that, they were basically sent down onto the earth. And obviously, you guys understand what's going on here. So it's like, yes, we live in this dunya, we live in this earth, but there are things that we shouldn't consume. There are things that naturally grow here that just are going to kill us. There are fruits that are literally growing out in nature. And you would think, ah, if it's growing, it's a fruit. It's growing out in nature. Then it's for my sustenance. It's, it's to keep my body good. Bro, go ahead. Eat that fruit. You're not going to be alive for another, what, four or five hours after you eat that fruit. 
So it's like, okay, if you can't eat that fruit, well, then it's very obvious that there are also other things that you can't consume. You know, it has dire consequences. And psychedelics is one of those things. So, yeah, tying it all together. Don't do drugs, kids. I, I do want to summary. I do, I do want to say, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, uh, the language is wali and hamima, the intimate companion. Like people take the shaitan or the intimate companions and they say, I wish I never did that. So that's how the presentation is always an intimate companionship. So that, that that's that's why right there. And I also want to say there are athkar and du'a that you say when you wake up as well. So I recommend everyone to get the book, uh, Haslan Muslim, Fortress of the Muslim, has English Arabic translation, very tiny book. So recommend everyone to get that inshallah. And I don't know if y'all want me to do this, but I could share experiences that I had when I was doing just one experience, how like when I started psychedelics, like all the cool stuff, all the beautiful things I was experiencing and then how it led to just the most terrifying thing. And, and I won't go too into details, but I could I could say this if you guys want to just drive everything home. I mean, bro, <clears throat> for research purposes, yeah, we got like five minutes. All right, for research purposes, for science, All right? So I started doing psychedelics and I had uh, that beautiful feeling of like being in the present. And I was like, wow, this is beautiful. Like, I love this. I, I never felt this before. It was such an amazing feeling. And then that like stuck, that, that stood with me to where it's like anytime I was sober, I would always want to like retake psychedelics just to experience that again. And then like the next time I took it, it was the same thing. But then this time it's like, I was getting like clear realizations over like what to do in my life. And I was like, wow, like these shrooms, man, these shrooms are something else. Anytime I would talk to shrooms or someone, I would hold them to a very high regard. And um, it got to the point where I started learning about the pineal gland, the calcification, all that stuff, the third eye. And that's when I was like, yo, I would love to be tripping as if I was on shrooms all the time. I would love to be in that present state and just be like, feel that all the time. So I started getting deeper and deeper into this. And I remember the first experience I had where it was, um, it was basically, I was decalcifying the pineal gland. And I remember I was, bro, I was literally experiencing this, this reality. And then from this reality, I shifted into another reality from my explanation, the best explanation I can give. I was on top of this hill where when I would look off, there was this ocean that was just going on for like just distance. Like it never ended, never ended ocean. And then when I looked in the sky, there were billions and billions of stars. And then as I looked around me, there were all these, these orbs floating around me. And every step I took, they all changed colors. And each color that they would change to were, were colors that I've never seen before in this reality. And then I remember like snapping back in to this and I was like wow like that was beautiful that was beautiful and then I remember here's where things start going sideways right because like as I experienced that I'm like yo this is it like I'm on to something here so it's like I basically once I I said this is it I'm on to something I fully submitted myself to it and I was like all right you know what I'm just gonna go balls deep into this I'm gonna see exactly what I can do what I, I can experience here and that's when things took a sharp turn. And I remember one day after a specific meditation that was like to open the, the third eye, uh, like during the meditation, actually, my eyes were like shaking and tears were coming out of my eyes. It's like, come on now. Like if I tell you guys that right now, <laughs> oh, man, he couldn't handle it, bro. He couldn't <laughs> handle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, if I tell y'all right now, like, what is that? What does that remind you of? Like, if if you're in a, a sitting position, you're fully submitted, and your eyes are shaking and like tears are coming out your eyes, like you would say that's a position. You you would say that's position, if something else is in control mm -hmm. at that point, right? Oh, so, true. in that moment, you know, I felt that I didn't think anything of it, and then after that, after the meditation was done, I remember I got up, 
And as I'm walking through the house, I feel these like weird sensations through my body, depending on like where I'm heading in the house. And I remember walking into my old room at the time. And as soon as I turned the light on, there was this big shadow in the corner of the room. And, and granted, there's never a shadow if the light is on. So I turned the light on. There's this huge shadow in the corner of the room. And I felt nothing but um, uh, malicious like eerie, insidious type of intention. And my body was locked up and all these like waves were going up and down my spine. And it's like the moment I experienced that, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm done with this. I'm done with this. Like, I don't want to take psychedelics. I don't want to do any of this stuff. And it took almost two years before I could uh, re-bring that boundary back up. And even once I brought that boundary back up, I still decided to do shrooms again. And the moment I did shrooms again, it's like that brown, that boundary was stripped and I started to experience all that negative stuff again. And I was like, all right, yeah, this ain't for me. I got to literally just stop this. And um, yeah, uh, again, there's way more details, but to keep it as uh, permissible as possible, I am uh, leaving a lot of the details out, but it, yeah, it's to drive the point home, like, yeah, don't do drugs, kids. It's power, man. That's a uh, that's left me speechless, to be honest. But it, it puts it into perspective well because we spoke about it for all this time. You, you've literally lived through it, so you know exactly what's up. Uh, you've been there, you've done that, and you know it's, it's not it. It's not worth it. So, Hamila, you came to that realization now or uh, uh, before? Yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. But yeah, with that being said. It's been a great episode. Thank you for being here, Ahmed, as well. You're gone, but um, thank you as well. I think um, his battery died. Yeah, probably. We got like what, like two, three more episodes left in the series. Minimum the series, two. Yeah, minimum two. All right. Well, with that being said, if you made it this far, go ahead and hashtag DMT. stay clean. <laughs> hashtag DMT. Hashtag don't do drugs. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. Khalil, do you have anything you want to say? Good, man. I'm good. I'll save it for next time, inshallah. All right. Well, with that being said, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Just going to keep recording. All right. <laughs> The reminder is that no matter where you are in life, you know, you don't know where you're going to be tomorrow. You could be feeling amazing one day and then literally lose your iman like that, right? The Prophet said that there will come a time where a person is a believer in the morning and at night they're a disbeliever.